It's Gators. It's Knowles. It's the Sunshine Showdown tonight here. We preview it all. Happy Thanksgiving in all kinds of weather. Let's get right into it. This is the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. And welcome in to another episode of the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. I am your host, Chris Yanes, alongside my co-host tonight, Neil Shulman. We'll be joined later by Dustin Smith. But guys, it is Florida, Florida State weekend. It's the Sunshine Showdown. We are in the swamp. 7 o'clock ESPN prime time, ending the season under the lights. Got to, even though we're down 5 and 6, fighting for a bowl game, this game still means something here in the state of Florida for all of us that live down here or are a part of the Gator Nation. But before we get into all of that tonight, want to make sure if you're not already please down below hit subscribe hit like leave a comment a prediction for what's going to happen on saturday night in the swamp for the gators and the knolls what you think is going to happen and if you're listening on audio format please rate and review the show it helps bring all of gator nation better content so we've got the showdown this weekend the number four florida state seminoles versus the unranked five and six Florida Gators who are fighting to make a bowl game. They have to win this game in order to gain bowl eligibility. They are on currently a four game losing streak, starting with their other arch nemesis, Georgia, followed by Arkansas, another rival in LSU. And of course the heartbreaker last weekend in Columbia, Missouri, 33 to 31. The Gators coming into this game are 11 and a half point underdogs as of this recording. And of course, everybody knows that both teams will be without their starting quarterbacks as Jordan Travis was tragically injured against North Alabama in their last game, a broken ankle, broken leg. He will miss the remainder of the season. His career at Florida State is over. And I think it goes without saying, Neil, we wish him a speedy recovery. We take in complete delight off the field when Florida State is struggling, on the field when they're losing games, but we never, ever wish for injury upon an opponent. And we wish Jordan, who is a good guy, off the field and a great player on it, a speedy recovery as he prepares to enter the NFL next season. And of course, we talked about our very own guy, Graham Mertz, injured on a Tebow-esque play as he was running for a third down, bulldozed a few Missouri defenders but unfortunately in the process fractured his collarbone and he will miss the remainder of the season will not play against florida state nor will he play in the bowl game if the gators are so lucky to get there so we've got two backup quarterbacks tate rodemaker for the florida state seminoles max brown for the florida gators both played very well in their backup roles last week of course rodemaker a much easier opponent in north alabama leading the comeback as the Knolls were down 13-0 in that game Max Brown almost engineering a comeback against Missouri. Neil, that's the storyline. Florida making a bowl game, and they got to do it with a backup quarterback against the team that's going to be playing a backup quarterback and who's still in the hunt for the college football playoff. Can the Gators ruin the Knowles season? What are your thoughts going into this game? We didn't need these quarterback injuries to create storylines for this game. Like they were already there. FSU seeking college football playoff berth, Florida seeking bowl eligibility and ruining FSU season again, like they did in 1997. That would have been plenty like that. That storyline right there would have been all we needed Uh, or all like ESPN and Fox and CBS and all the major media outlets would have needed to drum up interest in people watching this game or at least following it. This is completely unprecedented for Florida and FSU to have their starting QBs, both of whom were playing very well throughout the course of the season to get injured the week before get hurt and knocked out for the season. And now you have a battle of backups on top of that initial storyline that you already had in place makes for, I would say almost a historically rich storyline heading into this game, because I mean, think about it. Like if, if Tate Rodemaker takes FSU into the swamp and wins, and then they beat Louisville and they go to the college football playoff, even if they don't win the national title, that's still going to go down as a special little piece of history for Rodemaker. 
And if Florida ruins FSU season again, that's going to go down in Florida history as a historic moment where you again destroyed FSU's title dreams. So, you know, we'll, we'll get into that, um, you know, the odds and, and probabilities that Florida has to actually do it in a little bit. But, I mean, whatever happens in this game, it's going to be one that fans will remember as a long time as the as the backup battle. Like like two years ago was the eligibility bowl because both teams were five and six. Winner goes to a bowl game. Loser does not make it to a bowl game. This year you have that. You have the backup battle and you have FSU looking for a national title and Florida looking – for a bowl game and probably even much more um, joyfully the opportunity to rob FSU of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely brings me back to, I was only almost five years old at the time, but 1997 Florida state going in that game, I believe they were 10 or 11 and oh, whatever it was at that point, number one in the country, Florida went with kind of a, a backup quarterback and a starting quarterback, Doug Johnson, Noah Brandeis, but another 17 on the field for that game who led the comeback or who led the comeback and led the win for the Gators along with Doug Johnson. But now we've got another number 17 and Max Brown, who's going to be on the field and the similar thing, Florida state, while they're not number one, our top four at the time of this recording, getting ready to go to the playoff potentially with a win over the Gators and then a win against top 10 Louisville in the ACC championship game. They had, I mean, and look, despite the fact that Jordan Travis is not playing in this game, Florida state still has a plethora of talented players who have put up, incredible seasons that have led them to this point. So make no mistake, Florida State, while they don't have Jordan Travis, are still going to be coming in very ready to go in this game with the players that they do have. And they're very talented. They have made plays all gear. Guys like Keon Coleman and Trey Benson, their leading runner and receiver respectively. Those guys are still going to be on the field. And those they, Florida defense, who has struggled in the last five games, is going to have to come up with stops against those guys and a game plan from Austin Armstrong to contain them in order for to give our offense a chance to win this game. All right, Neil. So let's let's get into who Florida State is. And Florida State, of course, obviously 11-0 in the ACC. They have pretty much gone through their schedule unscathed. They have only played three games that were decided by one score or less. The closest game actually on their schedule came in the third week of the season when they traveled up to Chestnut Hill and nearly lost to Boston College, but they did win 31-28. to It was a two-point conversion was the difference in that game. Boston College almost got the ball back if it weren't for a penalty that allowed Florida State to continue their drive and run out the clock. A couple of weeks ago, they were within a, a drive from Miami tying the game. They ended up winning, though, 27-20 on an interception that sealed the game. They also came from behind on the road against Clemson, 31-24 to in that game. Clemson missed a field goal, which would have given them the lead with a minute to go in that game. And then there was Duke. Duke had them on the ropes until Riley Leonard was hurt in that game and went out. So they certainly have had their scares but by and large, they have played a pretty paltry ACC schedule. Many of those teams will not be playing in a bowl game or are barely making a bowl game in the vaunted ACC uh, schedule. Neil and I have made our thoughts well known about what we think it is to play in the ACC versus the SEC. Florida has played half a schedule of ranked opponents, some of which are in the top 10 or top five. Florida State they have only played one, or I'm sorry, two ranked opponents to date. They, at the time, played an LSU team that was in the top five, and we will give LSU their credit. They are a very good team. They have lost a couple of tough games uh, on the road that have led to their three losses, but LSU does have one of the favorites for the Heisman Trophy in Jaden Daniels. They shut him down in the second half defensively. And then, of course, Duke, uh, who was at the time ranked 16th, but since the injury to uh, Riley Leonard has fallen all the way down to six and five and a losing record in ACC play. So their schedule, not that great. They, they their best win to date is no doubt LSU. And maybe that Clemson game on the road has Clemson has started to rise uh, over the last couple of weeks and are on track to maybe win eight games this season. Florida, of course, we all know that what they've been through the last couple of games, ever since starting five and two have lost to Georgia upset at home to Arkansas in overtime. the, the, shootout in Baton Rouge until LSU ran away with that game 52 to 35 and then last week the heartbreaker on the road in Columbia they come into this game reeling needing a win for a bowl game without their starting quarterback 
but they could be getting some guys back for this game. Austin Barber did not play for the Missouri game. We'll see if he comes back for this game at this point. He is questionable, but that would be a boost to the offensive line. And we're not, though, sure if uh, Damian George will play in this game, who, well, I know a lot of fans have said that he has not lived up to expectations. While that is true, is injured, and that limits our depth on the offensive line, meaning we need to reshuffle guys and play a guy like Cam Waits, possibly, at the right tackle spot, or a Lindell Hudson, who transferred in from FIU and has played some ball this year and as that kind of that sixth, seventh man in the rotation. Also, there's a lot of guys on defense that are still banged up. Scooby Williams fighting illness this week. We'll see if he returns for this game. And then Cam Jackson, who's been fighting through injuries over the last couple of weeks, has played. We expect him to go once again for this game. But, you know, Neil, I just I guess I want to get your feeling going in. Like, you know, do, do does Florida have a chance to win this game? Because I think – a lot of fans look at this matchup and we say, listen, it's on the swamp, under the lights. Florida is 46 and 15 at home since the year 2000 in a primetime game. Good odds there if you look at that. They have a primetime win against a rival earlier this year where they were a touchdown underdog in. They went into that game and absolutely controlled that game from start to finish, one by two scores against Tennessee. Can they replicate a similar performance against Florida State? I mean, I know it's a very simple question. Does Florida have a chance? I, I think it is yet nonetheless a bit of a loaded question, but here's, here's what I will say in response. Yes, obviously Florida has a chance, but go back to what I said at the end of the Missouri game in, in the Missouri post game show, good teams find ways to lose games or good, sorry, good teams find ways to win games. Bad teams find ways to lose games. Florida over the course of this year, Minus one game against South Carolina where that was pure luck, where Ricky Pearsall tips the ball perfectly to Eugene Wilson, has found ways to lose games. Utah found a way to lose that one because special teams could not have done any worse. Kentucky, the defense gave up 275 yards to Ray Davis. Um, LSU, historically bad defensive performance. Arkansas, two more special team snafus. Couldn't, couldn't put the ball down for Trace Mack and a PAT. And then the special teams runs on the field while the offense is trying to clock the ball. Missouri, fourth and 17. Florida finds ways to lose games. They have done virtually nothing but that all year long. FSU, meanwhile, has been challenged. A lot of the, a lot of the games that they've played, the game control metric does not show a very dominant team. LSU was beating them in that first half. FSU flipped the switch in the second half, ran away with it. Boston College, FSU probably should have lost that game, but they didn't. They made the plays they had to make, took advantage of an opposing, what was it, 19 penalties in that game, 18 penalties in that game, took advantage of it. They didn't allow BC to survive that. Clemson missed a field goal. FSU probably should have lost that game, but they didn't. They took advantage of the opportunity that they were granted. Um, Virginia Tech was even a close game for a little bit. I mean, they took a kickback in the second half. They probably put a little bit of fear in FSU fans that, all right, maybe we're in a game we probably shouldn't be in. No, they slammed the door shut. Duke, quarterback gets hurt. But, I mean, I, I mean, you, you, you can't, like, praise FSU for that. You can't say that they did something good by, you know, Riley Leonard getting hurt because I mean, you never tried to hurt someone, obviously, as we talked about earlier. But again, they they had the momentum at, at that point and they ran away with it. They didn't allow that game to go down to the wire. Um, And, and even Pitt, they didn't look great in that game either. I mean, that was 10-7 in the second half, but took advantage of a couple of costly penalties by Pitt, ran away with it in the third quarter. Miami, even. That game probably should not have been anywhere near as close as it was. But FSU won the game. And you can go, you know, game by game and say, well, you know, the other teams made mistakes, but Florida, or sorry, but yeah, but but Florida State um, made the play they had to make. It doesn't matter at the end of the day if you want to credit FSU for that or if you want to just harangue at their opponents by, you know, saying how bad they are. FSU is 11 and 0. Doesn't matter their schedule. Because, I mean, LSU, again, SEC team that beat Florida up was in there too. Clemson, a team that is more talented than Florida. 
FSU still won that game too. Um, Miami, even they're not quite on Florida's level with talent. They're not qu- quite on um, SEC level in terms of talent, but they still have some talent, probably more than FSU does in terms of just sheer talent. FSU found a way to win that game. So, does Florida have a chance to win? Looking at the sum of the results the entire season from game one through game 11, seeing what Florida has done when they have been in close games, finding ways to lose, seeing what FSU has done in close games, finding ways to win. Yeah, of course, Florida has a chance because it's a rivalry game. It is in the swamp. The talent is fairly even. So of course, Florida has a chance, but looking at those results, I don't to pick Florida to win would be going against every piece of data that has been collected to this point. Put it that way. To pick Florida to win this game would be going against every single piece of evidence that has been rolled out to us so far this year. Yeah, I mean, that's true. And and you're correct. Florida has to, in order to win this game, they're going to have to make plays that they haven't made consistently all year. They're going to have to get stops on defense. They're going to then have to take those ensuing positions and score touchdowns, which was a key that I had in the Missouri game after what I saw against LSU, where they weren't able to take advantage of those opportunities. They're going to have to take advantage of those opportunities to swamp. Look, it's the crowd's going to be loud. The crowd's going to be with the Gators. You need to limit those procedural penalties that have been occurring in the last couple of games against LSU and Missouri. The crowd's on your side. I want to see a clean game from our offensive line where they're not putting us behind the chains and giving a backup quarterback and max brown an even difficult hill to climb more difficult hill to climb but i think one of the reasons why i think i believe florida has a chance to win this game is there's a new wrinkle now that both teams have to game plan going into the 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 florida state game before both quarterbacks got hurt i would argue that it was a much more difficult game plan for the gators defensive staff to account for with Jordan Travis, a quarterback who absolutely gashed Florida last year in Tallahassee. Those runs where he, that run where he was able to elude four or five tacklers in the backfield, avoid the sack, and then get all the way down to the one yard line when Florida at that point was up. They had them in a third and long, and then Florida State scored a touchdown on that drive, and obviously they went on to win that game. Now you don't have to worry about him on Saturday. In fact, you have to, you don't have to worry about a running quarterback really at all as Tate Rodemaker's strength is more of a pocket passer, similar to that of Graham Merz. Of course, he's still going to have his playmakers, Johnny Wilson, Keon Coleman, Trey Benson, Lawrence Toa Feely. But that's less and less thing you have to account for where now you're able to drop guys back into the zone or in, more in man and, and you don't have to account for the quarterback to escape. And you're able to key in on the run game, those running backs, and then drop back and hopefully make plays on those receivers. Whereas now Florida State, where they used to not have to account for a running quarterback, now has to account for a running quarterback. We all saw that Max Brown was able to use that, utilize that read option game, that RPO concepts against Missouri late in that game, which got Florida down the field and almost won them that game. Now they have to account for that. He can use his legs to get out of the pocket when the pressure is breaking down. And I will say it would have been a huge advantage this year for Florida to have had a more mobile quarterback, given the fact that they've had a lot of deficiencies on the offensive line. We've seen it all year long. They have not been able to the pass protection has broken down, whether that's the running backs or it's the offensive linemen. We have got put Graham Mertz in situations where he's been knocked down multiple times, if not sacked. Now you have a quarterback who, if it breaks down after his first or second reads, not there, able to take off and go and maybe scramble and get the first down or keep the defense back and having to respect the quarterback keeper. And then that then opens up opportunities in the, in the run game for ETN and Johnson to go off. So I do think that that is why Florida has a solid chance to make a move in this game and win it at home is one, obviously the crowd's going to be on their side. They have Florida, while they are not the home field advantage that they once were in the nineties and in the two thousands under urban Meyer, It's still the swamp. It's still at night. It's going to be a raucous environment. It's going to be loud. That's an advantage. And then coupled with the fact that Florida State now has to account for a running quarterback when they were not going to have to do that beforehand changes things. So, Neil, let's look at both of these teams and the playmakers that they have. While Graham Mertz is not out, 
Ricky Pearsall is on the cusp of doing something a Gator receiver has not done in 21 years, and that is break the 1,000-yard barrier mark for receiving yards in a season. The last receiver to do that, a lot of Florida State fans might be familiar with him. It's Taylor Jacobs. There's my rivalry joke for the week for anybody that catches why that is funny. But Taylor Jacobs was the last wide receiver to break 1,000 yards. He did it in 2002 with Rex Grossman at the helm and Ron Zook as his head football coach. There's been a couple of receivers that have come close over the years. Riley Cooper came close in 2009. Kadarius Toney came within 16 yards, I believe, in 2020. If he had played the bowl game, there is no doubt he would have broken it, but he set out the bowl game in the Cotton Bowl as the season at that point was over for the Gators. Kyle Pitts, if he doesn't get hurt on all those games in 2020, probably does it as well, as, as explosive as that offense was. But Ricky Pearsall has a chance to do that and go down as one of the greatest receivers in school history. Neil, I, I guess I want to get your thoughts on that really quick. Where would you rank Pearsall amongst Gator receivers if he is able to accomplish this feat? Uh, I mean, again, I don't know how much credit you want to give to quarterbacks for receivers um, abilities. I don't know how much you want to put the offensive line into that conversation. Like if they block long enough for quarterbacks to go through their progressions. Um, but I'll say he's, between 11 and 25 for sure i don't know that he's top 10 i mean percy harvin is kind of like that just that athlete i don't know if you want to call him a receiver or running back but even like even if you don't include him which like, honestly i think you kind of have to but even even if you don't i mean you have the, the three guys in the 96 team um i mean there, there was some back in the day too like a carlos alvarez um, you know, Natil, I don't know how you stack Pierce all up with, with those guys. Maybe you can make a case for like the back half of the top 10. Um, but I mean, regardless, if you're in the top 25 of Florida receivers that of all time, that's, that's elite status. So he definitely has that on lock. Um, I, I do think, I mean, it, like in the last show we were giving, um, we, we were giving Graham merch, like some some lamentations like saying, you know, what, what could have been if he had a defense um, if he does indeed leave after the season, which I'm not so sure is super likely, but if he does, then we're, then we're lamenting, you know, what could have been for him um, in this one season with the defense. But I want to give that, that same courtesy to Pearsall because he is definitely not coming back next year. And for all intents and purposes, we have wasted two years of Ricky Pearsall's talents by at absolute best going 500 that's if we shock fsu and then win the grab bag of a bowl game which both of those things are almost certainly not going to happen but at best five and five 500 probably going to finish with a losing record with two seasons of this elite receiver that we have so he's going to dearly be missed next year florida can replace the production i mean i think some guys waiting in the wings are possibly even more talented like let's say Aiden Mizell bulks up and fills out his frame he could be a real problem to take the top off the defense um I think a guy like a Dre Hawkins like a like a Tawaski can be just absolutely lethal like if you combine their forces on the outside but Pearsall is a guy that was always producing for us he was consistent in what he did and he just made things happen in some form or another like for example the catch against Missouri last week he just got belted it was a, what, a six, seven yard reception, but it's the little things like that. Bounced right back up. Bounced right, right up like it right. didn't even happen. And he, and he, and he held onto the ball. So it's things like that where you just produce consistently. You make the little plays happen like that, that aren't always so appreciated. And then you make big plays on top of that. You make all the plays and you're just a consistent playmaker. And he's going to be remembered by Florida fans. It should be remembered by Florida fans as exactly that, a playmaker. Yeah, I mean, it, it. you're right. You hit the nail right on the head. It is a shame we wasted the elite talent that is Ricky Pearsall because he's played like a receiver that should be on a championship team or at least a team that's won more than five games thus far. He's going to be missed next year, and it's going to be very difficult to replace a 1,000-yard receiver. So the reason I think I'm putting a lot of emphasis on this is that I think Gator fans, I hope, honor this, respect it, and don't take it for granted because 1,000-yard receivers at the Florida – do not come around very often. In fact, it's been 21 years. So hopefully we have more in the future, but we need to hopefully honor Ricky on Saturday and his senior day and send him out right. 
send him out right. Hopefully he has a big game. He's 52 yards short of breaking it. I, I would wager that he does it. He hasn't had a lot of performances below 50 yards this season. I don't anticipate this to be one of them. So we'll see. But, yep, I think it just it would be good to see it happen and, and hopefully do it in winning fashion. And if he did get to a bowl game, I would speculate that he doesn't play it because he's probably in line for definitely to get drafted. But I think he's a guy that he's going to go to the combine. He's probably going to run a 40 time. That's pretty fast. He's going to show off his ball handling skills. And a lot of teams are going to salivate over that. And he's probably, he's going to get drafted. I would say, I'm not saying first round, but I could see second, third round pick if he does everything right. And that, you know, the way things have gone in college football, a guy like him is not going to play uh, a meaningless bowl game where you're six and six. And, you know, I mean, look, it might not be meaningless to younger guys. And I think we'll talk about the importance of what it would mean to make a bowl game for our younger guys on this team. But for somebody like him who, you know, ball out, Ricky, ball out, leave the Gator fans something to remember that we'll talk about for we'll tell our kids about. I mean, this is this is this is the kind of game where if you make a play or you go win a game, a rivalry game like this, you'll be remembered forever. Like every Gator fan can play the in their mind when Jock has green caught that ball and got behind the defense. And then that led to the Gators victory over Florida State in 97. We all remember that play. And there's countless other moments in this Florida, Florida state rivalry where that's the case. And Ricky Pearsall has an opportunity to do that this Saturday with a big game. But outside of Ricky, we, we certainly have two running backs that can open it up for Florida. If we are to be able to run this ball successfully against Missouri, we had our best, one of our best performances on the ground 261 yards this is a game where florida if they're able to replicate that is certainly going to put them in a position to win and take pressure off a backup quarterback montrell johnson and trevor etn are currently both sitting at 710 yards apiece so talk about balance right there i know a lot of us have been complaining about the discrepancy in carries johnson right now only has 13 more carries to date he does have over five yards to carry etn Averaging almost six a carry at 5.9. ETN with more touchdowns, eight. And Johnson with four. ETN has been utilized a little bit more out of the backfield in the pass catching role as he does. Has shown that he has better hands where he has 173 through the air. And he added a touchdown last week up in Columbia. Outside, of course, of Pearsall, the other major playmaker who has sparked on the scene and has played like a freshman All-American, certainly a guy who will have a brick one day outside of Ben Hill Griffin Stadium, and that is Eugene Trey Wilson III, who now has over 500 yards in his freshman campaign, six touchdowns. He's done some things on the ground, too, with reverses. He's a playmaker, and he's a guy that is going to be able to, if you get him in space, make plays, and he's done it every single week. He's going to be a guy where we're going to be counting on to get to him in those moments. And then you have other guys that have stepped up, I think, in this year in the passing role. Arliss Boardingham, nearly 300 through the air. Khalil Jackson, who's made a lot of acrobatic catches. Uh, should have had another one against LSU. We won't, we won't rehash that at all, but it is what it is. Florida does have guys, though, that Max Brown can get the ball to, distribute it, and make plays. On the defensive side of the ball, we really haven't done much. And, you know, the leading tackler up until last week was Shamar James. Jordan Castell in the Missouri game surpassed him now with 58. And it is not a good sign when your safety is your leading tackler. Uh, that means guys are getting to that second and third level, forcing the safeties to make tackles and plays. Florida, you know, Prince of Yelan, we've given him a lot of flack. He does have six and a half sacks on the year. And if Florida is to have a big game, he is going to need to have that sort of Britton Cox money game that he had two years ago in the swamp against Florida State. This could be he could be playing for an NFL spot in this game if he does get to Tay Rodemaker in situations throughout. But we're going to need to see that. Derek Wingo, who has stepped up in the Missouri game last week, Hasn't played a lot this year, but has been forced into that role, given the fact that Shamar James is out. He's going to have to step up in this game, as well as some of the other younger linebackers, uh, like a Jaden Robinson or a transfer like Manny Nunnery. So Gators defense is a lot of young guys, a lot of young guys, Kelby Collins, TJ Searcy. They're going to have to step up in this game if Florida is to have any chance to make plays. Neil, 
given all of the what we just talked about, who are some guys you're looking at or identifying for Florida to have a big day and that can make a difference in this game? I mean, you just you just mentioned a couple of them. I'm looking for the defensive line to really put it together for all four quarters and not just have a couple of nice plays here or there. Like Princely has done some great things for Florida this year. He has set the edge at times. He has made plays in the backfield at times. He has not done it consistently. Um, TJ Searcy, Kelby Collins, I think are guys that are going to be very, very good for Florida in the next couple of years. They have been spotty, which, you know, they're freshmen. They're true freshmen. That's going to happen. But I'm looking to see them take the next step and, and do it more consistently for four quarters in a rivalry game against FSU this weekend. I am very high on Caleb Banks and Cam Jackson. I think those two can step up, and especially if Jackson gets closer to 100% health this week. Um, I mean, he's been battling injuries the last few weeks. He was, I mean, I'm not going to speak for him, but I would say he was at, at partial health against Missouri. If he gets more healthy this week, if he heals up a bit, and he takes the field with that adrenaline on top of the increased health. I think he can be very problematic for FSU with, by the way, an offensive line that's not awful, but is one that I think Florida can get the better of in the trenches. And then the secondary for Florida. Um, I mean, you can also say the linebackers is really the whole defense, but the secondary for Florida, um, Jason Marshall, J- Jalen Kimber, those two particularly have taken a beating from this fan base for a variety of different reasons. Not the least of which is that on some plays, they simply don't appear to be giving their best efforts. I'm not going to speak for them. I'm not going to say for sure that that's the case, but it definitely doesn't look like it on some plays, especially from number three. So um, this is not to be negative. This is me saying, look, like Chris just said, This is a rivalry game. This is a chance for you to get your name to be remembered by Florida fans forever. Missouri doesn't have that weight. Arkansas doesn't have that weight. The bad game tape that you guys put out in those games can be forgotten about and thrown away. You can make sure that your name is remembered in very, very pleasant contexts by Florida fans if you Turn over a new leaf for this game, and you make plays in this game that help the Gators win. So, you know, for all that we've said about the defense this year, and, and it has been awful the last month of the season, this is a chance for you guys to turn it around against a backup quarterback. You don't have to worry about Jordan Travis anymore, the guy who embarrassed you last year. So you're, you're going to get that additional um, level of – difficulty taken away from you you still have to deal with keon coleman um trey benson is still problematic but you don't have to at least worry about the guy at the controls being as dominant as he was a year ago because the guy at the controls has changed so defense pretty much anyone on that defense i'm looking forward to step up because we know the offense is going to move the ball it's done that all year long even i mean i guess I guess you could say they didn't really do their job against Georgia, but they did have the nice opening drive. So you saw that they can at least compete with Georgia, you know, for a quarter, at least Um, FSU, obviously not at that level. They don't have that level of defense. So if you can move the ball against every other non Georgia team that you face this year, then you have to like their chances to move the ball against the Knowles. But it's not going to matter if the defense keeps finding ways to screw things up and lose the game for Florida in the end. So pick a player on the defense or better yet, just say all 11 guys on defense. I'm looking for you to step up and do your jobs. Help the offense out for once this season because the the offense bailed you out against South Carolina. You made one or two stops, but you still let Spencer Rattler put up 465 yards. So you didn't win that game. The offense won that game for you and the football gods helped you win that game with that tip by, by Pearsall to Eugene Wilson. So um, defense, you got to do something for us this year. You got to win this game for us. Um, maybe you can say Tennessee, the defense had a hand in, um, but I mean, th- this is it. Like this is your chance to get yourself remembered for good reasons forever. And it's a chance for a lot of the young guys on that defense to make a lasting impact before they go into the off season. And build for 2024 you know leave the fans with something to get excited about next year on this defense i think there are several playmakers that we mentioned you know tj searcy uh kelby collins 
you know, somebody even like a Jamari Lyons, who's played a lot more on the defensive line in that rotation. You bring in back a guy like Kayla Banks, Cam Jackson next year on the defensive line. Like Jordan Castell, who's had his moments in the secondary, certainly has taken his lumps in SEC play. But I think we're still fairly high on him and his ability and his potential in the future. This is a chance for those guys to say, listen, you know what? This is a good team that we're going to be playing on Saturday, a playoff contender. If we show out and play all, one of our best efforts since the Tennessee game, then we're going to give the fans some hope because right now this was a top five defense going into or coming out of that the month of September. It's now a 110th ranked defense, according to teamrankings.com. They are 400 and they've given up almost 425 yards on the average this season. But as Neil mentioned in our last podcast after Missouri, we're now averaging almost 550 during our losing streak. That's just unacceptable, and it's not going to get the job done on Saturday. We cannot surrender over 500 yards if we are to, to win this game against Florida State. I really believe that. We're going to have to hold them probably to 500, maybe a precursor to a key when we get to that point later in the show. But this defense is going to have to make plays. They're going to need to get to the quarterback. And I think because Tate Rodemaker doesn't have the ability to even elude tacklers and get out of the pocket with ease like Jordan Travis does. This is an opportunity for guys like Princey Uman Yilling, Kelby Collins, TJ Searcy, some of our better pass rushers to get to Tate and, and at least hurry him up, maybe force him into mistakes and some turnovers. Right now, Florida only has three interceptions this entire season. Three. They only have four fumble recoveries. So we've forced seven turnovers the entire season. I mean, we. this is one of the worst at producing turnovers. Those are game-changing plays. Those put us in positions to flip the field, give the offense a short field, and win the game. So they're going to – a lot of that, though, is because they have not gotten to the quarterback enough because when you force him into bad decisions, that's when interceptions happen. And, you know, the our DBs, we talked about it last show as well. They have to start being ball hawks out there. There were several moments in the Missouri game they could have gotten interceptions. They didn't. A lot of the interceptions, the three interceptions that we've gotten this year, a lot of them have kind of been ducks. I mean, the one, I mean, the the one interception in the Tennessee game that Devin Moore got was the pass was affected by Desmond Watson getting in the backfield. He hit Joe Milton's arm. The ball was up there for Devin Moore to easily pick off. Jordan Castell, you know, he made a play in the Arkansas game. Miguel Mitchell, similar thing, but the, the, it's not. Those weren't situations where like we made a play on a receiver and got the interception. So we just have not seen them playmaking ability from the defense, whether it's getting interceptions, forcing fumbles, or getting to the quarterback. This is a game where you're going to have to do that. Otherwise, Florida State will rack up potentially 500 yards once again. And now we're going to bring in Dustin Smith. He is joining us here for this FSU preview pod. We'll give Neil a break for a moment and bring in Dustin real quickly to give his prediction for Florida State. And then Neil and I will give our predictions. So Dustin, welcome in. Obviously a heartbreaking loss last Saturday against Missouri. But we've got a rivalry game this Saturday and a chance for some redemption, a chance to make something out of this season. So quickly, what are your thoughts, I guess, coming out of that game and into this game and what the Gators can do to bounce back? Yeah, well, obviously the, the Missouri game was certainly a heartbreaker for the Gators, but they have all the pieces to be successful. Um, I really like what Florida has been doing recently on offense. I know it. It's a, it's certainly a heartbreaker that we don't have Graham Mertz, but what Max Brown was able to do um, in in coming in for Mertz, I think he did an excellent job. And then the, and then the dynamic, of course, of him being a dual threat quarterback, I think that really helps this team against especially an especially athletic defense that will that we'll see in Florida State. The big question is going to be the defense. Can Florida force turnovers? That's the big question. If Florida is not able to force turnovers against FSU, it's going to be a very challenging game defensively. We, we may see Florida needing to win in a shootout, and I'm not sure we could do that against a talented defense like FSU. But law of averages, something has to give. We saw Florida lose in a close one to Arkansas. We saw Florida lose, of course, in a close one to Missouri. Um, they shouldn't have even been in the game with LSU. But that game at points was very close. In fact, Florida did have the lead for just a little bit. Florida has to pull one out that they shouldn't. And 
I, I think you can agree with me on this, Chris. I think I think this is the game to do it. This is the game for Napier to prove himself. He's, you know, there's arg- there, there's argument both ways and whether he should be on the hot seat. But the question is not should he be on the hot seat. The question is what is the optics? And right now the optics for Napier is horrible. And he need he needs this one to really, to really to really win one with the fan base, and the Gators certainly have a chance to do it on Saturday in the swamp. He left a bad taste in people's mouth last year after he started six and four, got a big win on the road against AM, followed it up with a blowout win versus South Carolina, and then gets upset on the road to Vanderbilt and loses a, a close one to Florida State, and then of course gets blown out of the bowl game, three straight losses. Losing five straight this year to end the year would be catastrophic in in that fashion. So, but ending it though with a rival win over what your arch rival in the end state, who you're going up against for recruiting battles right now, and a team that is a national title contender in, in the college football playoff at this moment in time, he could win a lot of favor back with the fan base and give at least some confidence moving forward. And, you know, if we make a bowl game this year, we're not going to have a lot of opt-outs. We're going to have a lot of guys play in that bowl game by virtue of the fact that we've just a very young team. So that's an opportunity for these guys to play in a bowl game and to practice together and to pl- and to get another win, get a winning season. That's our path to a winning record this year is to beat Florida State this week and then get to that bowl game. But just the other factors uh, uh, attached to that, like you say, could win favor back with the fan base and at least going to the offseason with a little more confidence versus a five-game losing streak. Now, Dustin, what are some of your keys to the game now? But obviously the dynamic has changed now with Graham Mertz going out, Max Brown coming in, Jordan Travis going out, Tate Rodemaker coming in, two backups for each team. This brings a new wrinkle to the offense, though, right? Because now it gives an opportunity for Napier to introduce a running quarterback and Florida now doesn't have to game plan against a running quarterback. Yeah, I mean, Chris, it, it comes down to two players. Trey Wilson and Trevor Etienne. They have to get the ball and they have to score points. I know I said it before for, for previous matchups, but I would say combined they both need to they need to have the ball 35 times. I'm, I mean, look, Montreal Johnson is excellent, but he doesn't have the home run threat that Etienne has. So in order for us to win the game, we have to get explosive plays. We have to we have to get the ball in the end zone from way back, as I like to call it. We can't rely on on red zone appearances to score touchdowns in this game, especially if you look at Florida State's defense. They're excellent in the red zone. We have to score explosively. That's how you do it against this team. And in terms of the the dual threat capability of of Max Brown, he's good. He, he can certainly throw the ball. The fundamentals are there. But we have to we have to temper our expectations a little bit with Max Brown for two reasons, very quickly. Number one, we know Napier. He's not an aggressive coach. And he's not going to he's not going to give to Max Brown what he doesn't what he doesn't think Max Brown can handle. What I mean by that, he's not going to be aggressive throwing the ball against Florida State. We were just a little bit aggressive with a with an interesting play dynamic wrinkle and we ended up fumbling the ball and we could have scored a field goal on that on that drive against Missouri. Max Brown is it, it I, it's hard it's hard to slice it but Napier is going to be a very conservative with Max Brown and that's the concern. But yeah. and then on top of that, he doesn't have the experience that Mertz had with the offense and throwing mm-hmm. the ball. So the offense is also going to be dumbed down. So, you know, there's a lot of complaints with we're not we're not throwing in all these pass concepts. We're not being creative in the past game. Well, if that was your complaint before, that's probably going to be your complaint again. So, again, like I said, if we're going to win the game, especially on the offensive side of the ball, you got to get it in the hands of the playmakers. So if we're going to be creative, it has to be getting the ball into ETN's hands and into Wilson's hands. I like that. Yeah. I mean, that, that's been kind of the thing we've been clamoring for all year is when those guys are on the field together and they're getting lots of touches, the offense moves the ball and it's humming down the field. And then we saw that against Arkansas. We saw that against LSU. We saw that against Missouri. We've seen that time and time again, as those guys have exploded over throughout the year. And, you know, we need to just, we need to do it flat out. We need to do it. 
So with all that said, Dustin, give the fans your percentage chance that Florida has to win this game and then your score prediction. Absolutely. So generally during the season, I'll provide a model update that hasn't happened quite yet. That'll be coming out in the next few days. And so we'll be providing an official model expectation for both the score uh, expectation and also the percentage chance to win. So what I'm going to give you about what what I'm going to give you right now is a little bit of a blend from what the model has been saying thus far um, going into that Missouri game, of course. And then also a little bit about what I'm seeing with the matchup, especially understanding that the best the best player on FSU will unfortunately not be available. The reason why I say unfortunately is if you look at that injury, th- th- that's not the way I wanted to see Travis go. Um, for as much as we hate FSU, um, my my thoughts and prayers are with are with him and his family. That was very rough. But as far as the score percentage, I think Florida has about a forty five percent chance to win the game. Um, I think it's certainly more likely that FSU wins the game, but I am going to pick Florida to win. Now, keep in mind that the ESPN FPI, which I do tout a lot, I do have a lot of respect for, it's it's giving Florida State an an 81.5% chance to win. Now, I suspect that the ESPN FPI is not taking into account um, the loss of Travis. Um, I think if it did take that into an account, it'd be more like a 70% chance or a 65% chance, um, a little bit closer to what I'm thinking. Um, But I digress. As far as the score, I'm going to pick Florida to win by the score that they should have beat Missouri by. I'm picking Florida to win by the score of 31 to 30. And that's my score. It's not the model's output. We'll get that in in, in just a day or so. But, man, I I sure hope hope we're right. Hope hope the Gators can pull it out. It's going to be a big one. Yes, indeed, Dustin. Well, we thank you so much for coming on tonight and giving your prediction and your thoughts on the game. Certainly, we hope to be celebrating a victory in our post-game pod next week. And Dustin, wishing you a happy Thanksgiving, man, with your family and friends. And and we're certainly thankful for everything that you've given us here at the In All Kinds Weather Forecast and that model update week to week. Uh, but just happy Thanksgiving to you and, and wish you all the best this time of year. Thanks, man. Same to you. Same to Neil and everybody listening. Go Gators. Go Gators. And with that, let's go ahead and welcome back in Neil as we'll go ahead and do the final verdict where we now give our predictions for the Florida and Florida State game. Neil, give me your keys to the game. Keys to the game, I think, are going to be, I, I guess, a key that you could apply to any game because they are the great equalizer, but especially for this Florida team, turnovers. And not not just turnovers in a pure quantity perspective, because if you you know throw an arm punt fifty yards down the field and it's picked off and there's no return, that's great, but it's not the same as strip sacking, scooping, and scoring, or pick sixing, or even just returning it thirty five yards to flip the field. So Florida is going to need to force some turnovers to compensate for the fact that this defense if it doesn't force turnovers is probably going to give up enough yards to form a new continent because Keon Coleman, Trey Benson, I mean, those, even without Jordan Travis, this offense is frightening. So Florida is going to have to erase the opportunity for that to happen by ending FSU drives before they can end them themselves with points. So force turnovers for Florida Um, percent chance to win the game. I mean, I I think Florida will fight. I think that it will be a game for four quarters. I don't expect a blowout. But again, as I've said before, and I'll say again, good teams find ways to win games. Bad teams find ways to lose games. FSU has been challenged a lot this year. They have been in close games in the fourth quarter. They have won every single one of them. Florida has been in close games Several times this year, with the exception of South Carolina, which was, you know, you can argue was a lot more due to luck and the football gods shining on the Gators that day with a tip from Ricky Pearsall to Eugene Wilson. Florida has lost all of them. So what does that leave me with? Well, it leaves me with a Florida team that has about, I'd say, a 5% chance to win the game. They'll be in the game. They, They will have chances to win it. That's not what I'm saying. 
there will be opportunities for Florida to win the game. But the chance that Florida has to actually have more points in FSU at the end of the game, five. Score prediction? I will say that Florida will have the lead at at various points in this game. I think it will be a back-and-forth battle. But FSU will score in the fourth quarter to go up, and I think at that point they will hold it because I think that they will finally get a stop or two in the end. I do think that they will have problems stopping Max Brown, the, you know, the RPO option that the the RPO dimension that he brings is something new that they haven't really, um, or or they hadn't been thinking that they would see out of Florida. So that will be new for them, but I think they will figure it out by the time the fourth quarter rolls around. I think that's the point in the game where maybe you look for a Jared verse to sort of step in and assert his dominance in the trenches. I think they'll make a couple of plays on defense and they'll salt it away with another, uh, another, another another touchdown at the end. So I will say FSU wins 38, 27, but it will, it will not be a blowout. It will be a game that is a one score game one way or another until the last couple of minutes, kind of like the LSU game was until the last touchdown where it made it a three score game. So I'm, I'm feeling a game kind of like that where Florida's in it. They'll have chances, but they just don't take advantage of them. Okay. Well, my key to the game, I, I sort of alluded to it. I, I The defense has to make plays in this game. Neil talked about turnovers. I'm going to give you a statistic. We're going to need to be plus two in the turnover margin to win. I also think we need to get five sacks. This needs to be a game where we get to the quarterback and we have an opportunity to do it, get the crowd riled up. My percentage chance that Florida wins this game, I will give it around – I'll say 25%. I think that the home factor matters. Florida, excuse me, Florida is 46 and 15 since 2000 in night games. There is something magical about the swamp. A lot of night games, Florida, even when they lose them, they're not getting blown out. The only one that I could really think of in recent memory was probably what Alabama in 2011, Missouri in 2014, uh, Florida State, the 27 2 game in 2015. So there aren't a lot of examples to go to. I think that 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 makes a difference here, and that's why I'm putting the percentage chance much higher than what Neil is. ESPN FPI gives it about an 18.5 point chance. I'm on the higher end. Dustin's model will be out to update us, and I believe it is somewhere similar to in the neighborhood of where uh, we have it at, at 25 and 18%. Last week, I picked the Gators to upset Missouri 27-24. Came this close to doing it. And I'm picking another upset this weekend in the swamp. I am picking the Gators to win 38 to 34. This would have been the score if the Gators had won the swindle of the swamp game in 2003. So a little bit of an ode to that 20 years later. Still bitter about that game to this day. I think Florida in a back and forth game, though, unlike that one and unlike the Missouri one, get the job done. I think that this is a game where... Florida might have to go score a touchdown at the end to win it. But I think that they, with the home crowd, with all of the people have putting them down, this is a team that has still not quit. And I think that eventually we talk about, there's been three games this year where it was a close game and it was going one way or another. Florida's lost two of those three. I think Florida finds a way to even the score there and get one against the Knolls, and they get a play, whether that that sack that I talk about in the key or that interception to add to that plus two total that we need. Florida gets the job done, 38-34 in the swamp to clinch bowl eligibility. So we agree almost exactly on the type of game it's going to be. We we both agree it's going to be a back-and-forth game yes. that could go either way. I just see no – evidence to justify picking Florida to win that close. And that's fair. I mean, that that's totally fair because you're right. And that just goes to show, I think I'm just the eternal optimist. And like, at this point, like, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, we're five and six, like it's not going to hurt me one, my ego one way or another. If I wrongly predict for the second week in a row, an upset, you know, I mean, a broken clock, whatever, you know, that's what I, I guess maybe sound like now, but I think that, 
the home environment makes a huge difference. And a lot of Gator fans before the Missouri game actually said that Florida has a much better chance to win that game versus the Missouri game on the road. And I think that they were pointing to the fact that it was a night game at Missouri. Florida has struggled to play in Columbia before, whereas, you know, in the swamp, it's a different situation. And, and I, and I just think too, like you just look at this Florida state team. Yes. They're 11 and zero. yes. They're a playoff contender. But when you really dig down into it, like they've had a lot of games where it could have gone the other way. Like if Riley Leonard doesn't get hurt, I think Duke beats Florida State. If Clemson, Clemson makes, makes a field goal, goal they beat they FSU. Beat Florida State. Boston College yeah. doesn't have 19 penalties, they beat FSU. Right. So I, I, I understand all that. But I'm saying that FSU still found ways to win those games. And at some point, it stops being luck. It stops being just a string of anomalies. It just becomes who they are. They're well, a or, team that or better yet, out. their luck runs out. I mean, th- th- that does happen Maybe. too. Like Maybe. good team, good teams. I think here's the one thing, like they're not, like you said, they're not Georgia. Georgia hasn't had to deal with that this year. Like they've had their close game is like a nine point game to Missouri, but it's a game. If you go back and look at it, they controlled for the vast majority of it. That's a great team. And that's a team that is a juggernaut. Like, the other another example, I guess, was South Carolina. They were down 14-3 at half. They won 24 to 14. Right. Uh, but that wasn't a situation where it was down to the wire mm-hmm. at the end. Georgia, like they dominated them. Like that Florida State game versus Clemson, Boston College, even Miami uh last uh, the other week, that's a game that could have gone the other way. And uh, to me, those are just far more inferior opponents. Than anything that Florida's played, that anything that a team in the SEC plays. And I just don't think Florida State's been truly battle tested yet outside of that first game against LSU, which, to be honest, is a crapshoot because it's the first game of the season. So it's a little bit different versus something that, like, I think if those two teams lined up today, I think LSU would beat them. And if you look at Dustin's model over the last several weeks, that would indicate that LSU on a neutral field would be favored. Well, surely without LSU. Jordan Travis, it changes the dynamic a bit, but yes. Okay, but let's say even a healthy yeah, Jordan sure. Travis. Fine. I, Fine. I still think LSU beats him. Fair. Right now. But we'll see. I mean, it, it's going to be a great game. Neil and I know I know we're going to be down there. We're going to be tailgating uh, out there on the Gator Walk, but it, it'll, uh, it'll be good to be back. It's going to be a beautiful day in Gainesville, beautiful weather, night game. Really looking forward to maybe some sweatshirt weather here in the fall of Florida. You know, we don't get that very often, but looking at the weather forecast, it does look like those are in the cards. So I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy the rivalry atmosphere, a 90,000 plus sellout crowd, uh, a raucous atmosphere. I'm prepared to lose my voice. Uh, No matter what happens in all kinds of weather, I'm a gator till I die. So. You know, I'm riding with them. We'll see what happens this Saturday. That's what's uh, fu- that's what's fueling your prediction, right? I mean, a little bit. I mean, I mean a look, little bit of emotion, but I think I think players it, rivalries bring out emotion too. Yes, they and do. That's these true. Players are going to be they're going to have a chip on their shoulder, and there is going to be emotion coming out. And on the other side too, Florida State they would take they would take a ton of delight in keeping Florida for making a bowl game after we did the exact thing to them two years ago. Right. So, but uh, look, here's, here's the thing with, and this is probably the, the perfect way to end the show. Um, the in all kinds of weather moniker doesn't have anything to do with like changing the reality. Like that this isn't like Rick and Morty where you could just jump in the multiverse to different versions of reality where Florida is a team that is seven and four right now versus five and six, because they found ways to win those close games. It that that no, that's not how it works. Florida is a team that if you look at what they've done all year long, they have lost close games because they have found ways to lose, even when they were in complete control of the game. Arkansas and Missouri, and maybe even you can say Utah earlier, um, because of the double jersey infraction and just various mistakes with the play calling from Napier. But if Florida flips those results. And if Florida is seven and four or eight and three right now, even, I mean, I'm probably picking Florida to win the game because that would say to me, okay, this is a team that has done it, that they have been in close games before this year. 
And they have shown that they are able to pull away in the final moments and make sure that they wind up with more points than the other team. This team instead has a history this year of making sure that the other team has more points than they do. And it comes in a variety of fashions, whether it's bad play calls, whether it's bad in-game decision-making by Napier, whether it's just a bad defense or it's a bad special teams or the offensive line just chooses to implode for a few plays. It's going to be something. It's something different almost every time, but it is consistent in terms of finding ways to lose games. I really hope I'm wrong. I really, really do. I would love to ruin FSU season. I would love to shatter their dreams of a college football playoff berth. I'd love it. I just don't objectively, realistically see it happening because there's no evidence that tells me that that is going to happen. I'm going on the recent past to predict the future and that recent past, meaning this season, the relevant recent past, that data tells me that FSU has about a 95% chance to win. So look in all kinds of weather, I will always, always be proving, I'll always be rooting for myself to be wrong when I predict Florida to, to lose the game. But that's an example of going with your head and not your heart. Cause my heart is screaming for me to pick Florida my head just says, you know what, this is the data, and that's just probably not what's going to happen. But I'll say this, if I'm wrong, I will happily come back on this show, and I will eat crow. You know what, Chris, what was it that I pro- – it was, it was after Georgia, right? I promised to jump into the St. John's River if Florida beat Georgia. Um, I don't know that I'll logistically be able to make that work after this game, but I will find a point in time to make it back to Jacksonville at some point in the offseason, and – I will actually no, I got one. I got one better. You got to do a cold plunge in the Atlantic Ocean in South Carolina. Okay, I can do that. No, go you go down like Sullivan's Island or whatever it is. Have yeah, Alan that's, have that's, Alan take a video of it. That's 30 minutes for me. I can do Perfect. that. Perfect. All right, there it is. So on a chilly morning, you got to go down there, do a plunge. Sure. You got it. Okay. There it is. You there got it. Go. All right, guys, we're all rooting for that. We're rooting for Neil to be wrong, and he's going to have to do a cold plunge in the Atlantic Ocean as the winter months here approach. (laughs) Sounds good. All right. Well, from all of us here in all kinds of weather, thank you all again for tuning in. If you have not already, please below, hit like, hit subscribe for this show. Leave us a comment of what you think is going to happen this Saturday night in the swamp. And make sure if you're listening on audio formats, please rate and review our show. It helps us bring you great content. Also, as you both can see, or as you all can see, both Neil and I are wearing our in all kinds of weather merch. He's got his nice quarter zip as our fall winter weather approaches, something great to buy there. And then, of course, I've got the polo on because down here in the state of Florida, it's nice and 70, 80 degrees. I got off the golf course earlier today, actually fired my best round ever, shot a 91. Good almost job. broke it. Almost broke ninety. If I had, if I had, you know, not left a few putts short, we would be having a different conversation. But hey, that's like the Gator shoulda, coulda, woulda. And of course, want to wish all of you and your families a very happy Thanksgiving. There's certainly, obviously, this is not a football season to be thankful for, but there, I'm sure, there is plenty of other great things in our lives to be thankful for, and at the very least, our family and friends are those. So, Neil, very thankful for all that we've done together this year, with in all kinds of weather. And I just wish all of our listeners the same, a healthy and happy Thanksgiving, and hopefully a surprise in the swamp this Saturday night. ESPN, if you're going to the game, do not do be loud. And if you're thinking of selling your tickets, do not sell your tickets to FSU play fans, please. All right. I think that gives it a, a show from all of us here. Have a great Thanksgiving and go Gators. Go Gators. Prove me wrong, boys. Prove me wrong. Let's go.